Hi everyone. So we are honored to have with us today Gergay Ambrus. Um, Gergay is from the Rain Institute of Mathematics or, and from the University of Szeged. He's a very active uh, discrete geometer. Uh, he's also the double academic brother of our Pablo Soberon. They had two PhD mentors in common. Uh, and um, today he'll tell us about the critical central sections of the cube. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And especially thanks for pronouncing my name well. It's, I see you put some effort into it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about a uh, work that is joined with my uh, MSc student at the University of Segand, Bodabas uh, Gardian. And it will be about uh, sections of the cube. And um, it's uh, quite an old topic. And then a number of things will come up and I gave the subtitle, The Secret Affair of Eilad, Laplace, Poya, Irvin and Paul. And we will see that all of these names will show up during the talk. Um, so let's so let's get started. Um, so we are working uh, with the cube and now for the cube, I will use this uh, cube of, of edge length one in n dimensions, and I will just denote it by Qn. And we are interested in cube sections, but now only hyperplane sections. So only n minus one dimensional sections. In this talk, we are not going to talk about lower dimensional sections, even those are quite interesting as well. And we are interested in central sections. So now I put the cube centered so that it's a uh, center of symmetry is the origin. And I call a section a central section if it contains the origin. Fair enough. And I'm interested in the volume of these sections. Um, that is the n minus one dimensional volume of these sections. And I, I use v per for, for this hyperplane. So v is the normal vector. And we will assume that it's a unit vector. And then, well, we can define a function of this normal vector, v and v as the section volume. Um, of the orthogonal section. All right. And then the basic question is for which sections is this volume minimal and maximal? And that's the most essential question here. And now these have been answered. But so this is really the starting point. Um, so here is a, an example. Everyone knows the three dimensional cube. And then we have these three central sections. And then um, it's quite surprising that if you are just uh, looking at these sections, well, if you if we are asking for the minimum, uh, it's more or less uh, well. I wouldn't say obvious, but but it's believable that the the minimal section is the is the one on the left, namely the one that is parallel to a facet of the of the cube. But now we have these two other guys. We have the the, the middle guy, which is orthogonal to a two dimensional um, face, and then we have this uh, guy on the right side, which is this regular hexagon, which is orthogonal to the main diagonal of the cube. And now you ask, all right, which one has larger area of these? And now that is not obvious. And then one has to do the calculation. And it turns out that actually the middle has a larger volume than the right one. So, so if we check the numbers, we see that the central hexagonal section that has roughly volume 1.3, I mean, area 1.3, while these uh, two diagonal, as I'm going to call it, section in the middle, it has area square root of two, which is strictly larger than this 1.3. And that is surprising. And that is the first instance of something that is you know, not, not uh, as we expect. And now the question comes, all right, what happens in higher dimensions? Um, so here in the three-dimensional case, we see that the minimum is the, is the red section, the maximum is this purple one, and the green one is in between. All right, and then for the minimum, it's quite well straightforward to conjecture that the minimum is always parallel to a facet. Um, so, so the situation that we saw in the three-dimensional case um, is replicating itself in higher dimensions as well. And that is true. And then it was first proved by Hartwiger in 1972. And, and also 
Hensley gave another proof in 1979. And in the same article, he proved the first non-trivial upper bound on the center sections of the cube. And he was using probabilistic methods for that one. So it's an interesting paper for that. And it was also proved by Waller. Also it, in 79, at least the paper was also published in 79. And so I, I said that, well, now we are just interested in, in hyperplane sections, these are minus one dimensional sections, but he also proved that uh, the, the minimum, he also proved the minimum for lower dimensional sections. Yeah? So he proved that k dimensional sections are minimal when they are parallel to k dimensional faces. So that's the same thing that we see for, for the n minus one dimensional case. So, so in, in that respect, the minimum is completely known. And then we turn to the to the maximum, and then we expect that to be harder, because um, at least in the three-dimensional case, it is non-trivial. So the situation is non-trivial. Then the question, all right, which are the maximal sections? And as I mentioned before, Hensley in '79 he proved a universal upper bound. So he proved that any central section, regardless of the dimension, uh, has volume at most five. So at most five times as much as the as the volume of the facet, which is surprisingly strong. So we would expect that, well, usually, you know, when dimension grows to infinity, then we have some, some exponential factor or something like that, or an exponential estimate. But it happens that here it's not the case. This five is a universal upper bound uh, for every n. And then the question, all right. Is it sharp? Well, Hensley showed that this is not sharp. And then he conjectured that, well, the situation that we saw in the three-dimensional case uh, also happens in higher dimensions, namely that the maximal sections are, are attained when the section is perpendicular to the diagonal of a two-dimensional phase. That is, its normal vector has the form uh, one over square root two times one one zero zero zero, etc. Of course, we can take any two coordinates of this normal vector, and and even I can take ones or minus ones because the symmetry. So we have a lot of uh, central sections with the same volume. But then he conjectured that this is the maximum. And then, well, the academic father of of Pablo and me, uh, Keith Ball, proved it in eighty six, and that was a very famous. Uh, remarkable result. He proved that this is indeed the case that any central section has volume at most square root of two, and then it has center, uh, it has volume uh, square root of two if and only if it is uh, perpendicular or orthogonal to the diagonal of a two-dimensional phase. So that proof is is uh, quite complicated. It is using a technique that we are going to see later is using the integral representation for the volumes of the central sections. And, uh, and then it, it uses uh, several series estimates for, for uh, the functions in question. And yeah, it, it's, it's highly non trivial So it's, it's a very fine analytical proof. All right, so now we know that the minimal sections are perpendicular to uh, uh, one of the, the standard basis vectors that is parallel to one of the facets. The maximal sections, are uh, per, uh, orthogonal to the main diagonal of the two-dimensional phase. And now the question, what happens with the others? Um, so at least here in these two examples, we see that, well, both of them are orthogonal to a diagonal of a phase. Well, um, it's a, well, I, I can say that, well, it's orthogonal to a diagonal of a one-dimensional phase. Um, for the minimum and then orthogonal for a two for the diagonal of two dimensional phase for the maximum. And well, um, that's the question. What happens for the other directions? Right. So in other words, what we see is that any central section has volume which is between one and square root of two. And it's very, very, very sharp. If we, if we see the upper and the lower bounds are almost the same. So it can also be formulated as the cube is surprisingly fat in every direction. That's, a, that's another way of saying this, uh, this phenomenon. And in that respect, it, uh, well, 
it behaves quite differently from from let's say the typical um, convex bodies of n. Okay, and then also by this we get a very nice counterexample to the Busemann petty conjecture, an old question um, that you are probably familiar with. And um, that is the, the the question. Well, assume that we have two centrally symmetric convex bodies, so that uh, every central section of the first is smaller than the central section with the same hyperplane of the second. And then, of course, one would say that, well, then the volume of K should be less than or equal to the volume of L. And, and then one thinks that, well, you can just do some double integration or something like that. And, well, it's very plausible to believe this fact. And it's a beautiful fact and a beautiful conjecture. Um, but unfortunately, it's not true. And well, the first counterexamples that were given were in much higher dimensions, but then when Kiesebohr proved the uh, this uh, maximality of the of the two diagonal sections, then actually we see that it provides a very simple counterexample to this conjecture. Namely, if we just take a, a ball and then we take a cube, and then we let's say we normalize the cube and we normalize the ball so that the cube has slightly larger um, volume, then it turns out that, well, we know that every central section of the cube is roughly small. And then when one does the calculation, then it turns out that, well, this actually works whenever the dimension is at least 10. So whenever the dimension, the number of dimensions is at least 10, then if you take a ball and a cube of, well, a slightly uh, larger volume, it turns out that the, all the central sections of the cube are smaller than the central sections of the ball, even though the volume of the cube is larger than the volume of the ball. So that's a very beautiful and, and, and very simple counterexample to the Buzeman petty conjecture. And it's very surprising that, that such a natural conjecture is just, uh, well, it's so not true. All right, but so let's let's return the let's return to to sections. And so I said that well, these two extremal sections that we have seen are orthogonal to diagonals of a phase. And then let's introduce a notation. This D and K will be the diagonal of a K-dimensional phase. Um, well, and so I can up the permutation and then taking plus minus ones. I will just uh, denote this vector by D and K, which has the form one over the square root of K times one, 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 zero, 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 zero. OK. So this is the main diagonal of a K-dimensional phase. And then we can take these K-diagonal sections that I'm going to call. And K-diagonal sections will be just orthogonal to D and K. OK. So what we saw that the maximal section is a two diagonal section and the minimal section is a one diagonal section. And then we somehow feel that, well, these diagonal sections, these are the, well, extremizers that we know, and then maybe they are also the local extremizers of this uh, central section function that we introduced. And well, now we know that the one diagonal section is minimal, the two diagonal section is maximal. So all the others are in between these two. Yeah, the three diagonal, four diagonal, five diagonal, and so on. These are in between these two. So the first question, how do these compare to each other? So what happens when uh, when 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 we change k? Now let's know that this doesn't depend on n. Yeah, because of my normalization I was always taking the cube of edge length one. Therefore, if I take the two diagonal section of a five dimensional cube or a two diagonal section of a 10 dimensional cube, it will have the same volume. Um, we can just embed one into the other. Um, so, so this volume depends only on k, well, as long as the number of dimensions is at least k. And therefore, we can introduce this uh, notation nu k, which will be just the volume of the k diagonal section. Now, because of symmetry, it doesn't matter which k diagonal section I'm talking of, um, because all of these have the same volume. Good. And now this is what we have seen before, that all these diagonal sections, they have 
they lie in between the one diagonal and the two diagonal sections. And actually, we know a bit more. So Hensley, in this in this uh, 1979 article, he proved that well, um, when k goes to infinity, then we know that the k diagonal sections they converge to a limit, and this limit is square root of six over pi, and we will see why why this is true. Um, so this is implied by the central limit theorem, and then we will see that uh, in a sec that how the probabilistic argument or probabilistic method comes up here. But so notice one thing that this uh, square root of six over pi is strictly less than the square root of two. Yeah, and square root of two was the maximum. So we see that, well, this 1.38 is smaller than the two, two, and this is the, the picture. So we have the first one, which is one. We have the second, which is the maximum, it's root two. And then we have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on. And it seems that these form an increasing sequence. Um, and then the limit is slightly below this root two. So the limit is this dashed uh, red line. So that's what we see when we plot the, the function. We will come in a sec to the question how to compute these, these volumes. So it's a natural conjecture to believe that that these new k's they form an increasing sequence at least when k is at least three. Yeah. So we know that the sequence is not increasing between two and three, but from dimension three onwards. And that's what what we would believe. I mean, that's what our intuition tells us that somehow we would feel that well, the main diagonal section should be maximal. Well, it happens not to be maximal. But actually, because only because this two diagonal section is a, is an outlier, and so it seems that that basic the, the universe is is nice from three onwards, so that we are in, indeed having this nice increasing sequence. Actually, more can be seen. It it seems well on this figure we cannot see it that much, but it seems that um, this sequence is 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 in fact concave at least from. Uh, six onwards, and that is uh, well. That's uh, that's still a conjecture. It is more or less known that the, the sequence is concave from some index onwards, and we I will, I will get to that later. Um, but so this is still an open question. All right. So let's see this monotonicity. So Aliyev um, in. 2021, so three years ago, proved that this inequality holds. So monotonicity would say that nu k is at most nu k plus one. And this is slightly weaker than that. So he proved that square root of k times nu k is monotone increasing. So if I put this extra factor of root k, then I get a monotone increasing function. And then, so actually this came up in relation with, with a completely different uh, uh, thing. So that was, uh, yeah, it, it, this question was, was raised by Imre Baran and Peter Frankel in in, uh, in their paper, Cutting the Cheese, when they are basically taking the cubes of, a, or cells of a big hypercube and then try to uh, cut it with hyperplanes. So this is what Aliyev proved. And then, well, it was, published in the same year that uh, the, these new case indeed form an increasing sequence from k equals three onwards. And it was proved by Bata Fodar and uh, Bernardo Gonzalez Merino in 2021. Um, and their proof again uses a very fine uh, analytic arguments, um, which use a series expansion of four integrals uh, up to order seven. And then it's very fine comparisons between these terms in the series. And then it has a, well, so, so the paper itself is uh, something like 15 pages long, and then it has an appendix of the calculations, which is another, I don't know, 20 pages. So it's uh, quite technical. Um, but so they prove that that indeed we have a monotone increasing sequence. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. I'm just curious. So, what? How did such a paper look like? What, like what tools are being used? Uh, like, um, you say so, so I, 
I will, I will get to, to a sec. So, so, so the basic question is how do you compute these sections? Yeah, how do you compute new K? And so far we haven't seen that, but, but we will see that it is possible to compute these new Ks uh, exactly using an integral. And then once you have this integral, then, then we know series expansions for that integral. integral. And then you have to do numerical calculations. And so basically they prove that, well, um, it holds from some index onwards and then below that index, they had to check it numerically. Um, so that's the very, very, very rough uh, outline. Of Thank the you. But so, but so yeah, so the, the basic question, how do, you, how do you compute these things? How do, how do you work with these uh, sections? So as I mentioned before, this is open that that the 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 the, the sequence is concave uh, for at least for k at least five, and then if we zoom in, then this is what we see. So we really see that well at five, if you see that there is a small dip, um, so it is not concave between four, five, and six, but from five onwards it seems to be concave, and then numerically you can check that it is indeed concave. Um, but so it hasn't been proven yet. Okay, so this is just zooming in between the second, third, fourth, and so on. So we see that at the beginning there is some sort of irregularity, but after that it's really smooth and so Good. And then so let's just see the, the three-dimensional case. And then this is a plot of the of this function when when the dimension is equals three. So then we can parameterize the normal directions by two parameters. And then this is how it looks like. So on the peaks, we see the, the two diagonal sections. In the valleys, we see, see the one diagonal section. And then you have this saddle point, very nice saddle point in between the peaks and the valleys. And that saddle point is the three-dimensional, the main diagonal sections. So, so this is how it looks like. And now if you see, a, if you check a cross-section of that, this is how a cross-section looks like. So in the middle, I have the two diagonal section. At the, at, the, at the side, I have the one diagonal section. And the main diagonal section, the three diagonal section, is at this inflection point. Um, so this is how, this is how the, the function behaves for, for n equals 3. All right. And so, well, I, 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 I told you that the proof of case ball is, is uh, very nice, uh, and it's uh, very analytic, I would say. And then the question comes up naturally well. Um, now we know that the main diagonal sections, they form an increasing sequence, at least from three onwards. And we know that their limit is smaller than the two diagonal volume. Now, if we knew that all the critical directions of these functions uh, occurred at the diagonal sections, then it would imply that the maximum is indeed a two diagonal case. And then it would give us uh, another proof uh, for the maximality of these two diagonal sections. And then basically a proof that, that provides some insight into this uh, phenomenon. So that's a very natural question. Is it true that all the critical directions uh, or all the critical points of this, of this central section function are at the diagonal directions. And then one would say that, well, of course, it's, or at least one would have the feeling that, of course, it, it is true. At least in the three-dimensional case, it looks like that, well, indeed, we have only these, uh, only these critical points. And that's the, that's the, basically, the main point of, or the main question that we are working with. Is it true that the critical directions are all diagonal? All right, so what is a critical direction? A critical direction is just a critical point of this function on the unit sphere. And then it's a nat natural question, are all critical directions diagonal? And so question, how do you characterize critical directions? Um, or how can you find critical directions? But so actually there's a nice characterization that was uh, proved by Ivanov and Tsutsurupa. Uh, in 21, and I proved it uh, by a completely different methods in 22. And, but so the characterization is, is the same, well, luckily. And, and this is the characterization that, uh, well, the unit vector is a critical direction if and only if this funny 
equality holds. So now what is this? So it tells us that the that the volume of this uh, well, this convex hull, I will show you in a sec what this is, uh, is proportional to one minus VK square, uh, where VK is the kth coordinate of this uh, normal vector. And now, so let's see which volume are we talking about. So basically what you have to do is that you take the origin and you take the central section, and then you take the intersection of that with the facets. So now this will be n minus two dimensional um, polytopes. And then you take the convex hull of the origin with these n minus two dimensional guys. And then you'd see, you check the volume of these, where the n minus one dimensional volume of these. And then the characterization tells us that, well, the section is critical if and only if these volumes are all proportional to one minus vk square, or as I denoted on this picture, one minus ak square. Okay, so all of these are proportional to, to these one minus ak squares. Well, apart from the apart from the trivial cases. And then um, this can be used for for uh, working with critical sections, because then if we find a vector for which this condition holds, then we know that this is critical. And then this is actually what we are going to do. So as we saw before, the two and three dimensional case, all the critical directions are diagonal. And now what happens in the four dimensional case? And then using this um, uh, characterization, Actually, one can see that a surprising thing happens that there is another direction, namely this guy 1, 1, 2, 2, which is a critical direction, but it is not diagonal. Well, 1, 1, 2, 2 normalized, of course. And, and so I, I, I wrote it up in this, in this article that in the proceedings of the AMS uh, in 22. And then the question, all right, what happens in higher dimensions? Can we use the same characterization uh, in higher dimensions? So, is it true that in higher dimensions, um, all the all the critical directions are diagonal, or are there outliers in every dimension? Well, so now of course, one should really ask the question: Are there full dimensional critical directions that are non-diagonal? Because of course, if I take a diagonal direction in a lower dimensional case, then it will be also critical in, in the higher dimensional case. So in the four dimensional case, we see that the one, di one diagonal is the minimum, the two diagonal is the maximum, as we have seen before. The three diagonal is a saddle point, and then the four diagonal is, um, well, is a local max. The, yeah. Okay, so the question, can we find non-diagonal critical sections? And then, well, Based on the four-dimensional case, one thing that maybe yes, and so there is a, a a very simple way for at least conjecture in that. So let's see. So it is true that the main diagonal direction is a local maximum, and then it can be proved um, by our methods basically. But so just take it for granted that the the main diagonal is is a local max. The two, the two diagonal is the global max. And now just connect these two with an arc, with a great arc on the on the sphere, on the unit sphere. And then let's see what happens. Well, so one sees something like that. So on the two diagonal case, we have a global max. In the main diagonal case, we have a local max. And now in between these two, there should be a local minimum at some point. And now because of the symmetry, one one feels that well this local minimum this guy which which on this plot is about at the about zero point four this guy should be a critical point and it should be a settled point like in this direction in it is a local min but if we see if we check an orthogonal direction it's a local max and it turns out that this is indeed the case this is really the, how this thing looks like and then. The reason uh, why in three dimensions we we don't see that situation is that we just don't have enough directions, so or we just don't have enough dimensions. So really, from four dimensions onwards, this is how it behaves. So if we just connect with the great arc, this two diagonal and n diagonal, then we see a local min, and this local minimum is going to be a critical direction. 
Um, and one can indeed prove it this way. Um, well, one would have to prove that the, the, the main diagonal is a local maximum and that, okay, that can be uh, achieved as well. And so this is what we do. And then it turns out that there is always a non-diagonal critical central section whose normal vector is of the form A, A, B, 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 B. So basically it's a, it's a renormalized version of, let's say, well, one, one, X, 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 X. Um, and so that is surprising. Um, but it also shows that, that this proof idea for the maximality cannot work because we have other critical directions. So somehow it, it expresses that the behavior of this function is, is non-trivial. So if you if you check the, the function on, on the on the unit sphere, it is it is yeah, it's non-trivial. Um, all right, so let's get let's get back to the question of Adam. So how do we prove this and how do we work with these um, um, sections or how can we compute these sections? And so actually that goes back quite a long time ago. And it goes back to Laplace more than 200 years ago. And then he, he found a formula for the main diagonal sections. Um, and then Poya, 100 years later, generalized it to, to all the diagonal sections. And this is his formula. So remember, V is the normal vector. And then this V and V is just the volume of the section orthogonal to the normal vector V. And then he tells us that, well, you can calculate it as an integral where you have to integrate this product of these sinc functions. And the sinc is just sine x over x. So that's sinc x. Okay. And then you have to take all the coordinates of the normal vector. You take the sinc of vi times t. So sine of vi times t over vi times t. Now we see that, of course, when x goes to 0, this converges to 1. This is how this sinc function behaves. And now you integrate this over the real line. And this integral is going to give you precisely the volume of this central function. Now, why is it true? We will come back to it. OK, but so because at the first time, it's, it seems quite surprising that, uh, well, such an integral gives back this uh, central volume. All right, so how or why does this integral come up? And then the answer for that is the probabilistic method. So let's imagine the following. Now let's just, uh, so before I was working on the QB dash length one, and now for a sec, let's just take IID random variables on the interval minus one, one. So I'm just taking twice the Q. And then I take N of these random variables, X1 up to Xn. And now if we just notice that if we just take this vector x1 up to xn, then this is, and I multiply it by one half, then this is a uniform random vector on the cube. So very good. And the other thing is that, well, what I'm interested in, I'm interested in, for a given normal vector v, I'm interested in the central section. Now, what is the central section? Where is the set of vectors where the inner product or scalar product will be zero? And then I can just write this scalar product in terms of the xi's. Yeah? Namely, the inner product is nothing else but the sum of vi times xi. Yeah, where this q is a unicorn point in the cube. Now, how can we calculate the volume of this central section? Well, I take a small slab around about it. Yeah, a slab of width, let's say, 2 epsilon. And I calculate the volume of that slab, and I divide it by 2 epsilon. And when epsilon goes to zero, well, this should go to the to the volume of the central section. Well, it works in almost all cases. But on the other hand, uh, we can write it in terms of the random variables. And now this is just the probability that this sum, this uh, linear combination of the random variables has absolute value at most epsilon. And now we see that when, when epsilon goes to zero, this is going to be expressed by the density of that function, of, I mean, of that random variable, the sum at zero. So really, the volume of the central, fan, uh, central function, uh, the central section can be expressed as the density of this random variable at zero. And now the question, how can we express this density? 
Um, well, so if we just see, in general, we have a, a random variable, f of x is just the density. But we can express the density using the characteristic function. And the characteristic function is just defined by this expectation of uh, e to the i times t times x. And then it has some nice properties that we all learn in probability. Um, and well, if we have the uniform random variable, then the only thing that we should know is that the characteristic, characteristic function of that is exactly, exactly the sync function that we have seen before. So when x is a uniform on zero or on minus one, one, then the characteristic function of that is the sync. And by Fourier inversion, I can express uh, the density function using the characteristic function by the basically the Fourier transform formula, the inversion formula. And then when we use it for this special case, then what we see is that, well, the characteristic function of this linear combination is exactly the product of these thing functions. And now, because of the inversion formula, I get that the density function at any uh, coordinate r can be expressed by using the these uh, sync functions. And then at zero, actually the, the second cosine term vanishes, and then this is what we find, that the central section can be expressed as the integral of these sync functions, and the product of these sync functions. So that's how we that's how we calculate it. All right, and then uh, well, this is how it looks like. And then this linear combination it has a name and it's the Irving Hall distribution. And now it is uh, studied quite much in statistics because it comes up a lot in statistics. And then the the value of the densities for, of this Irving Hall distribution is a statistical question. So this is Irving and all they were uh, statisticians. And then actually we can also express it for not only the central function functions or central sections, but also sections at the distance r of the center. Okay, and so this integral is called, well, we call it the Laplace Poya integral, because it was well, Laplace for the main diagonal sections and Poya for the general uh, diagonal sections central sections and then this is Laplace and this is Oya and so if we just write this integral now it's a very simple integral we just take the integral of the sink function to the n and we multiply it by cosine rt and we see that the central section function has the volume j and zero and so the question, all right, we just have to deal with these integrals and then can we somehow massage them or, or um, handle them well? So I'm just going to skip it, but it's a quite interesting, uh, well, I would say debate or whatever, series of papers in 1944 and 1945. So just basically during, still during the Second World War, then uh, a number of of, of uh, statisticians they were really arguing about uh, the calculation of these integrals and the series expansions for these integrals, and so a number of of uh, well, basically the story goes that there there came a first paper which which provided a series expansion, but it happened that well one of the terms was not correct, and the second paper corrected that, but then it turned out that that was not correct again. And then really five or six papers, uh, they came up after each other. And then, uh, well, I'm just, yeah, uh, skipping this, but uh, there was quite a fierce debate. And uh, well, here I just, I just read one sentence that, that said that Silberstein's aim was to determine rigorously the function PAX and its limiting form as n, n goes to infinity, and it's a pity that his mathematical technique collapsed at the point where rigor is most needed. <laughs> and then, well, basically they are just uh, continuing the same uh, style for the, for, the, for the other papers. And then eventually it was Methurst and Roberts in 1964 who managed to basically correct all the, all the, all the mistakes that had been done before. 
And so these are all about uh, series expansions for, for this integral. And now we know that, well, this is how the series expansion looks like, at least the first uh, three terms of that or four terms of that. Um, and then this is another formula, which is used for exact calculations. And then, uh, well, it's quite nice. It's a commentary of formula, as we see. Um, and then one can see that, well, maybe because it's a commentary formula, it might have some connections to commentaries. It turns out that it is indeed the case. And then it, based on that formula, there is a very nice recursion that we, that was proved by Thomson. And then if we see that is uh, connecting the nth row to the n minus first row. Yeah, so it expresses j and r as a linear combination of j n minus one r plus one and j n minus one r minus one. So it's a very nice connection between these two things. And then it might look familiar to someone who, who is interested in permutations because this is the point where Euler comes to the scene. So what are the Euler numbers of the first kind? Well, it's basically the number of permutations of the numbers one to n in which there are exactly L essence. Okay, so exactly L places where an element is larger than the previous. And then one can ask, all oh, right, what is the number of these? And then, well, this is the commutator formula. And then if we look at the formula for J and R, then we see that these two are very similar to each other. In fact, the two are the same if N plus R is even. Yeah, then we can express this J and R as an Eulerian number. And now it gives us a connection between cube sections and permit number of permutations. Yeah, completely unexpected, completely unexpected. Um, and so this is the way that, that uh, we are using. And so there's a requisite definition of Euler numbers, and also there's a rec recursion for, for these uh, laplace poya integrals. And then, uh, well, we now see four different interpretations of this, of this uh, central section function. It is first the value of the laplace poya integral, then it is related to the central diagonal section of the cube. Then it is the peak of the Irving hole density, and it is also an Eulerian number. So it turns out that these four concepts are really the same. And, and it gives us a, a, a very nice connection between these four things. And it turns out that the geometric uh, estimates that we need boil down to estimating this ratio between the um, these these uh, Eulerian numbers or, or uh, Laplace Poya integrals, where the index is jumping by two. And I will not go into the details, I will just skip over them, but, but it, it's uh, very nice that in basically in all our proofs, the proof boils down to this very same combinatorial inequality that we need. And so actually, Lizzie and Nicola proved that um, this inequality holds for every even number. And again, their proof is very but technically demanding and diffuses the series expansion that we have seen before. And what we do is uh, we prove this inequality or these two inequalities by completely commentarial methods using only the recursion that we have seen before. And, and so actually what we prove is uh, proven upper and the lower bound for all these uh, uh, fractions, J and R plus two over J and R, where N and R are essentially arbitrary. And then these are the forms that we prove um, for the lower and the upper bounds. And these are carefully, very carefully well designed and, and really found so that the recursion works. So, so basically, once you have this inequality for a row, then using the recursive formula for J and R, you can prove it for the next row. So that's the idea. That's how we, we prove this inequality. And then once you, once you know that these are the bounds, then actually verifying them is not hard. 
because you just use the recursion and then, well, you will end up with some polynomial inequalities, but um, basically you have to prove the non-negative of some polynomials, um, which, are, which are which can be done. It's not, not too hard. So really the hard part was to find these, uh, find these bounds and uh, to find them in a way so that one can deal with the algebraic uh, calculations or, or algebraic machinery that came up. So what we did is a commentary proof for, for this inequality. And now this inequality implies many things, implies inequalities for the Eulerian numbers, but also implies that there exist non-diagonal non critical directions of the, of the cube for every dimension at least four. Um, so this is a corollary for Eulerian numbers that we proved, but let, let me just uh, round up with, with uh, showing you very quickly how do you use it for the cube sections. So we will prove that there exist uh, non-diagonal directions which are critical. And then, well, based on my previous paper, the characterization of these critical directions can be written up as this, uh, well, this analytic condition that uh, this should hold, um, this equation should hold, and then one can express it well that this function is zero. Um, so now we will play for k equals two, and uh, so we will just have a normal vector of form a, a, b, 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 b. And then basically we have to prove that there exists an a for which this f and k a function equals zero. And then this is how it looks like. This is how this function looks like for f62 and f63. And then basically we have to prove that there is a non-trivial uh, zero of that. And, that, and in the f62 case, it will be this uh, x intercept between 0 0.6 and 0 0.7. Um, all right, so, well, for the, right end of the interval, we can just prove that uh, that this is positive. This is not very interesting. But so now we have to prove that there exists a, a point where this derivative is um, uh, well, negative. And then, so we can just calculate the derivative of that function, and then this is the derivative. And well, so this is how the derivative looks like. And it's very ugly. Um, yes, and then, well, one starts to do some simplifications. And basically, I want to I want to find that the derivative at one over square root of n in the middle is. Okay. And then it turns out that, well, using the recursion, this derivative is can be simplified to this form. And then if we see that in the parentheses is n plus one over n, j n zero minus j n minus zero, that should be negative. And that is exactly the inequality that we prove um, uh, by the comment here. Oops. And then essentially this comment estimate proves us that there is an entropy of zero for this much. And so this is very much in a nutshell, but so so this gives us, uh, gives us an idea how to, transform these commentary estimates to um, geometric or analytical um, So now, it, so what we proved is that there are basically non-diagonal uh, critical directions of the form A, A, B, 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 B. Now, the natural question, well, are there also such sections uh, whose normal vectors are of the form, let's say, three A's and M minus three B's or four A's and M minus four B's and so on. But it seems that there, there are no such um, uh, sections. Um, so numerically we checked it for N equals six and seven. But so I, I, I would say that it's quite plausible to believe that this is the only one. Um, this is the only one that, um, that is non, non diagonal. So, all right, the second question, which is open, is that this non-diagonal critical direction is a saddle point that we found. So it doesn't um, exclude the possibility that all the local extremal sections are diagonal. And that would actually be sufficient to prove or find an alternative proof for the maximality that we for proof. Um, now, and this is a very interesting question. So I 
I said to you that the monotonicity, if you remember the monotonicity of these diagonal sections, it was proved by this very technical paper. So can we find a simple proof? I mean, a commentary proof for that, uh, based on the same same ideas that we, we use for this uh, critical reactions. It turns out that uh, probably you can, so we are working on it right now, but so let's wait for it. Another question for the concavity that I, I, I mentioned, can we find a commentary proof for the concavity? central diagonal sections. And then one can study lower dimensional sections, other convex bodies, projections, and so on and so on. So there are a lot of open questions. Um, but so basically, the main motif here is, is that we can use a commentary inequality that via probabilistic tools transforms to a geometric uh, inequality. And then this, uh, yeah, this, this uh, whole setup is, is, is very nice and very effective and very efficient. So that's it. And thanks a lot for your attention. And I hope I didn't go over time too much.